All right, we're back with uh, our small group uh, study series entitled uh, How to Love Someone You Hate. Uh, the, uh, we're on lesson number four, and this lesson's uh, title is A Walk a Mile. Walk a Mile. Uh, I want to start with um, some questions. Uh, normally, if I'm doing a live class, uh, we do a little bit of a review. So I'm going to give you a chance to uh, do this review. Uh, with me, I'm going to ask the question and see if you can kind of keep up by uh, giving me the answers uh, based on some of the material that we've covered uh, so far. So here we go. First question. What is God's strategy in loving those that we hate? What is God's strategy in loving those that we hate? Answer to that. Aggressive good. We overcome evil with Aggressive good, not just good, but aggressive good. Next question, why does aggressive, here I'll show it to you, there it is. Why does this strategy work? Why does aggressive good work? Answer, good is more powerful than evil. Good is always more powerful than evil in the end. And of course, it feels better. I mean, when you're, when you're continuing to wallow in the evil, if you return evil for evil, uh, as far as a Christian is concerned, that doesn't bring you any peace, doesn't give you any satisfaction. But the ability to return good for evil, as far as a Christian is concerned, uh, enables one to feel peace, even in a, a difficult uh, situation. Next question, what scripture is this strategy based on the scripture that we're supposed to be uh, memorizing each day? Answer, uh, whoops, uh, there we go. Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil uh, with uh, good. Next question, what is the first step in overcoming evil with good? How do we do that? Where do we start? Answer, bless, don't curse. Bless instead of curse. Uh, what, uh, and, and last time we, we talked about, you know, how, uh, how we bless, you know, we, we, we say good things about that, the, the person we hate to God, we say good things about the person to other people, we say good things to that person, so on and so forth. Well, we start there. What uh, uh, scripture is this uh, uh, based on? And the answer is um, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Name, next question, name three ways that you can uh, bless your enemy. Three ways that you can bless your enemy. Everybody think about that, three ways. All right, here we go. Number one, pray for them. Number two, say good things about them to other people. I mean, right, we say, we, we pray for them, so we're actually saying good things to God about them. Uh, say good things about them to other people and say good things to them when we have an opportunity. I don't want you to raise your hand, obviously, but uh, how many have begun taking the first step? How many in the group are, are, are consciously taking the first step. And if you have, do you feel better? Do you see some of the feelings of hatred, some of the negative feelings starting to dissipate somewhat? You know, I also realized that uh, it was easier and more comfortable to keep my dislike. Remember we talked last week about um, the flesh. You know, there, there's always a war between the spirit and, and the flesh. And in my own experience with people that I disliked, people that I hated, people that you know, I couldn't stand for whatever reason, I, I found that it, it was easier to hang on to my, to my dislike. Um, it, it wasn't easy uh, to say good things uh, about that person to someone else. It was so much easier to continue in the negative, to continue saying bad things it was a whole lot easier to nurse my grudge. It was a whole lot easier to continue to kind of seek some kind of a sympathy, if you wish, uh, for what that person had done to me or for what that organization had done to me, whatever, you know, whatever, the, whatever it is. It's a lot easier to, to say bad. It's a lot easier to keep cursing 
than to stop that behavior and to begin saying good things about that person. But in the end, it's, it's so much more, so much more uh, satisfying. Uh, all right, so today um, we're going to move on to the next step in learning to love. Remember, we, the title is loving the person you hate, not just tolerating them, but loving them. So the next step uh, in loving uh, another uh, person is walk a mile in their shoe. Walk a mile in their shoes. You know, I'll give you an example. I, I uh, as a preacher and teacher, I, I love to teach other people in the congregation how to, you know, how to do a devotional or how to prepare a, a, a lesson, a Bible class lesson, or to prepare a sermon, perhaps to write an article. You know, I, I enjoy training others and mentoring others uh, to do this kind of uh, work. A picture you have on your uh, screen now is of a young uh, minister, Titus West, and uh, he is, uh, you know, one of our interns at the Choctaw Congregation, and he is being trained and he's learning how to do the work of a minister. And I get great uh, joy in, um, in uh, teaching him and encouraging him and training him. And I enjoy doing this for several reasons. Number one, um, it helps them grow spiritually. And so, of course, all ministers want to see you know, the congregation and especially those people that they're training in ministry. It's, it's nice to see them grow and to uh, develop. It also blesses the church and it provides more workers for the kingdom. But I, I have to admit that I also enjoy seeing people um, uh, come to the realization that what I do for a living, the ministry that I have, is not easy. You know, there's a, a, a usual joke about preachers, and that is they only work uh, once or twice a week. You know, they, they only work Sunday and Wednesday. You know, they, get the, they preach on Sunday and they teach a class on, on Wednesday. And, and believe it or not, I've actually had people uh, ask me what it is that I did the rest of the week. So you get up and you, you preach and then maybe you teach a class. Yeah, what, what do you do for the rest of the week? Well, when people actually try to write a, a 10 minute uh, devotional, maybe a two page devotional, or maybe uh, they attempt to write a 300 word essay for the uh, bulletin. And, and they tell me that they struggle for it, uh, they struggle with it, with that assignment for days or weeks, some of them. They then begin to understand how difficult it might be to write 50 to 60 pages of new material every single week week in and week out, in addition to other things that need being done by the minister. You know, a sermon, uh, maybe 15, 20 pages of material that you have to write, and it's new every week, it's a different one. And if you teach a class on Wednesday night and Sunday morning, there's another 15, 20, 30 pages of research and notes that have to be uh, written. And if there's a bulletin article and a devotional, you know, there's a lot of uh, work that goes into these things. And so, uh, in other words, when people try to do some of those tasks as part of their uh, training, uh, they get to walk a mile in my shoes. And in doing so, they can feel just a little bit of what it's like to do my job. And my job is not unique. I'm sure that uh, if I had to learn, um, uh, you know, one of uh, the people in the church, an accountant or someone who's a, a mechanic or something, if I had to learn their job, uh, I'd get a greater appreciation of what it, what it really requires to do uh, their job. And so hopefully uh, when people know that, the net result will be that they'll understand me as a person a little bit better and they'll appreciate what I do uh, a little bit better. Well, this in essence is what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 12 verses 15 and 16 as the second step in uh, learning to love the one that you hate. And that is walk a mile in their shoes. And so he says in verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. So Paul is talking about uh, relating to, um, uh, to other people. And in doing so, in these two verses, he gives four commands and all of these 
um, are in connection with the people that we don't like. Four ways to help us walk a mile in their shoes. So what does he say? First of all, rejoice with those who rejoice. Well, it's easy to do this when it's people that we love, but it's much more difficult to do it when it's people that we can't stand. Their joy usually makes us angry and jealous, you know, like the older brother and the prodigal son. The father was happy that the prodigal came back, but the older brother, you know, his father's joy made him jealous made him angry. And sometimes that's our reaction towards the people that we hate, people we can't stand. If they succeed, if they have a good thing that happens to them, it makes us angry. Why do they get all the good? You know why? They don't deserve that. In other words, their joy makes us angry and jealous. Um, he says, mourn with those who mourn. Again, it's easy to mourn with those that we love. Uh, however, Usually when things, bad things happen to people we don't like, we don't mourn with them, we rejoice, right? Well, I'm happy. It couldn't have happened to a nicer person is what we say, right? And so Paul kind of turns this on its head. Uh, when the person that you can't stand rejoices, try to rejoice with them. With the person you can't stand mourns, try to uh, feel what they feel. Uh, uh, try to you know, um, uh, relate to what they're uh, going through. And thirdly, he says, live in harmony with one another. Well, we want not to care about the people that we hate. That's the problem, right? We, we want to totally put them out of our lives, but their presence or their memory creates bad feelings and awkward moments in us. So the, the thing that we do is we, 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 we don't want to be in harmony with them. We just want them to be gone and leave us alone. Paul says we should live in harmony, not just get along, but of a similar mind and understand what they think and where they come from and why they do what they do. This requires a great spiritual effort on our part. Understanding their behavior doesn't justify their behavior but it does help us see the reasons for it and may create some sympathy, uh, the beginning of some empathy for them. And, and if you're ever going to get to the point of forgiveness, you need to have some sort of sympathy or empathy for the person that you're going to forgive. And the only way to get to that is by at least having some sort of commonality with them rejoicing what they rejoice, mourning, understanding what they're going through. You, you can't get to a point of forgiveness and empathy unless you, you have some sort of understanding of the other individual, which is exactly what you don't want to do. You have to fight against the, the natural impulse of your flesh when it comes to your enemy. And the, and the problem is when it comes to your enemy, you sort of feel justified in doing these things. So it's, it's, it's counterintuitive all the way from beginning to end to, to fight that, uh, that natural feeling. And then he says, don't be holier than thou. You know, ever notice that in every situation where you dislike someone, uh, it's usually you that is right. It's usually you that is the victim, the innocent one, and the person that you dislike who is completely guilty, totally unworthy. Ever notice that's how we cast you know, the scene? Uh, much of the hurt that we feel is usually a result of the feeling that the other person is unworthy by their words or by their actions. They're unworthy of our love. They're unworthy of our association or friendship or service or anything, prayers. Paul says that assuming the higher position will destroy any chance at reconciliation. They're beneath me because they hurt me. They're not worthy of my forgiveness. They're not worthy of my prayers. We get to that point eventually. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get so far away and above them that we do not care about them at all, zero. Well, that is the wrong way to get to the point of loving our enemies. We must get to the other person's position, whatever that is, if we're wanting to understand, if we're wanting to relate, to forgive. And this requires giving up our assumed uh, superiority. So 
the first two steps in learning um, and what we're doing here in, in this series is we're learning how to do this. Uh, the first two steps in learning to love the people we can't stand are these. Step number one, manage your mouth. It starts there, right? It's, it's in the heart, but it goes to the mouth. Begin by managing your mouth. As Paul says, bless and don't curse. That's step one. And then step two, walk a mile in their shoes. In other words, try to understand their feelings and their thoughts and their position. Even if their thought or position is wrong, try to understand what it is. It, it, it will lead you ultimately into some form of understanding of the individual and you need understanding of the individual if you're ever going to, uh, to forgive. Remember, God knows us. He sent his son to, 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 to be like us in order to assure us that he does understand. He understands exactly how we feel. He understands exactly the pressure of life, the pressure of human life. He understands it. And for that reason is able uh, to forgive us uh, completely with understanding and with uh, empathy. So these two steps can be done without direct contact with the person that you can't stand. And they must be done if you plan to have some kind of successful contact with this person in the future. And they absolutely have to be done if you want to move from, from dislike and hatred to understanding, to forgiveness, to love. Uh, you have to, you have to, <laughs> you know, you have to manage your mouth you have to have some sort of uh, understanding of where they're coming from. So those are the first two uh, steps in, in the process. Um, I've got some questions now for our small group uh, discussion part of this uh, series, and I'm going to give you those. And we'll be back next time for the next lesson in the series. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Question number one. When something goes wrong in your life, do you seek first to understand or be understood? Where is your focus? Give an example. Question number two. Have you ever had an opposite emotion? For example, the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son. What caused it? Question number three. How can you better understand where someone is coming from? Question number four, consider a person you cannot stand. What, in your opinion, are some of the emotions, thoughts, and positions that may be causing their annoying or hurtful behavior? 